Nadine, welcome and thanks for being here. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm really excited to chat with you because in researching for this podcast, you have so many areas of expertise, including a couple of my favorite topics that we're going to get to go into. And before we jump into all the fun science, I have a note that your great uncle inspired and edited the James Bond series and that Goldfinger is dedicated to him. And that's amazing. I would just love to hear a little bit about that. Oh my God. Yeah, that's so fun. Well, yes. So his name is James William Plomer, or is it William? Oh my God, now I'm not remembering. William Plomer, it's William Plomer. And his first book, he actually wrote, I believe he was spent a significant amount of his time in South Africa. And he actually wrote the first book that had like an interracial love story. And Virginia Woolf was his editor for his first book. Um, and then later he actually did a lot of editing himself, I think for that same editing company. And a young Ian Fleming, wrote him a letter at about his books and stuff and he really encouraged it and edited his you know helped to develop that and edit his books and yeah goldfinger is dedicated to him and um another fun book that he did uh the poems for is a book called the butterfly's ball and the grasshopper's feast which later became it's funny because he was quite old then but became a, a rock opera by i can't remember who purple 70s 60s 70s band purple something anyway yeah and so I love that because it had all these great illustrations and it was a book that I could understand as a kid but he wrote all the lyric poems for that as well he oh he was nominated for a poet laureate in England at some point as well so yeah he was a pretty esteemed author <laughs> that's such a cool story I'm a very talented family the genes are strong with you guys um, well, you have your own expertise in many areas. One of them is oral health, which has been a research topic for me for over a decade since I first, um, with so many pregnancies in a row, started getting cavities and had always been told, of course, the mouth can't heal and that this was just inevitable. And my background was in research. And so I started researching that and realized perhaps there's more to this story that we've been told. And there's a lot, at least a lot more factors than I was told in my dentist office back then. So I'd love to sort of unpack some of these ideas today. The first being the role of the dental microbiome. And some of the mm -hmm. listeners may have at least heard of the concept of the oral microbiome, but I would love for you to kind of explain it at a high level and then we'll kind of get into some of the more nitty gritty of it. Yeah, I love that. And that's such a great place to start um, with the oral microbiome, which is definitely something we didn't even know about growing up and understanding the microbiome has really come into focus really in the last 10 to 20 years. So it's really important. And then I love researching too. And whenever I'm going into an area of the body, cause I like, I'm really like low mate. Like I like to not put effort into things, you know um, I've got other things to do than, you know just beautify myself all day. So I like to look at like, what's the natural design of the body and like, where are we getting in the way? So to me, it's like, well, we weren't born with a toothbrush in our hands. There's got to be systems in the body that care for our oral microbiome or like, you know, not that we always knew about the microbiome, but our oral mouth. Um, and what can we do besides, you know, doing what the dentist said, which is like brush your teeth and come see me every, you know, twice a year. And it's also important to know that because I didn't really get this growing up because you feel like your teeth are formed. So that's kind of like they're kind of like rocks in the mouth and they're not necessarily connected. But of course, the teeth are fully connected to the body with the roots and the blood system and through the microbiome. Um, so what I also learned through just studying other dentists and their research is that there's something that I like to call the invisible toothbrush. And what affects the microbiome, what's connected to that is there's a whole dentineal lymph system. And that's pretty revolutionary. So it's really this dental lymphatic system that brings nutrients to the tooth. So when we chew, the substrates, you know, they're activating, we're chewing and there's a whole bunch of chemical messages happening. And the parotid glands, which are right sort of like in the jaw by the ear, um, they, you know, they're receiving messages. They connect to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then sends out messages. You know, as we're chewing the food, it goes down, you know, into the blood system. It's digested by the stomach. And then this, um, you know, and then the, then the tooth is like a tree with roots. And then the blood, you know, traveling to the teeth, and then the roots are picking up that blood, bringing it into the tooth. 
in the tooth is a core called the pulp chamber. And in there, there's the dentin and all that juicy stuff. And to me, that's really kind of the heart and soul of the tooth. That's where we really need to think about when we're caring about it. And then that blood runs up into the tooth. And then in, in that pulp chamber, there's a, a, you know, stuff that happens and that blood fluid gets fenestrated and pushed and it changes into a lymphatic, a clear lymphatic liquid. And then odontoblasts, which are like these little pumps inside the tooth, they pump out this lymphatic liquid, um, which is drawn into the tooth and then kind of is in like a centrifugal fashion, comes out and onto the surface of the tooth. So the teeth kind of have this like lymphatic microscopic sweat that comes into the surface of the tooth. And then that coalesces with the saliva to kind of be a toothbrush, to clean the tooth, to prevent cavities. Or if there's an area that's weak, like a cavity is coming, it will help um, you know, repair that area with the saliva. So then that system, if we're stressed, um, if we're having like, you know, sort of peak hormonal times of like teenage days or pregnancy, um, or if there's chemicals in our diet, or if we're eating a lot of sugar, and this isn't about the sugar sitting on the teeth, this is about the sugar that that is then affecting our blood sugar levels. Um, if that happens, that system, that dentine lymphatic system goes stagnant, which isn't good because then you're not getting the nutrient circulation. If that stress and that stagnancy continues, the dentine lymphatic system actually reverses and then our teeth become like straws, sucking into the tooth from the mouth, all the stuff that's in the mouth. So that's like virus, bacteria, et cetera. And then that is actually the genesis of how a cavity is formed and how we, you know, that's the beginning of not healthy teeth. And so that's quite, that's like a deeper and understanding of the body system, how it's all connected than sort of that what the American Dental Association decided in the 1940s, because they were like kind of debating at that time, is it systemic, is it not? And what won in that, those days was the acidogenic theory, which is where we, that's where we are today, is that acids and sugar, like you know, sugar or soda sitting on the teeth is the cause of cavities, which again, that's not ideal for our teeth, but it's deeper than that. It's the whole system, right? And like having an acidic body, or you know, sugar that's affecting the blood sugar levels. So I feel like that's just such a good thing for people to know. And then of course, within the oral environment, there's a whole balance where we wanna have like the, a, a nice homeostasis for our oral oasis, and that is the microbiome. And so many of our modern medicants for dentistry, you know, just walk down that drugstore or aisle and all of the tricks of that aisle really are disruptive to the oral microbiome. For example, um, your, your basic mouthwash that's in the drugstore, they create over, with a synthetic alcohol over 30, I and mean, this, this is like a 10 year old stat, so I'm sure it's increased, but uh, 36,000 cases of oral cancer a year are created by these synthetic alcohol mouthwashes. For example, you know, that because why it's throwing off the microbiome of the mouth. Um, so is the triclosan in toothpaste or the saccharin or the sodium lauryl sulfate creating receding and bleeding gums. So literally then the tools of the trade are making it a vicious cycle, an uphill battle to kind of get a grip on the oral microbiome. That was such a great explanation and it brings so many important points to light. I think I think of the comparison with how the conventional approach to dentistry reminds me of how often people think of skincare, where they think just, oh, I'll treat the outside topically, but yeah. so much more comes from the inside and what we're putting in our body, not just on our skin. And the same, of course, is true in the mouth. And I think when you explain it so well like that, it becomes much more logical that, of course, we wouldn't want to kill the oral microbiome, just like we wouldn't want to continually take antibiotics and kill our gut microbiome. People understand that, but that all of these really harsh things that we're often told to use in our mouth might actually be creating more problems than they're solving. And it, it from my understanding, you can probably explain this better. There's kind of almost competing 
things going on when we're talking about problems like gingivitis versus cavities. And that's kind of different bacteria that can get out of balance that make one or the other more problematic. Is that, am I right about that? And if so, what is, what are some of the ways we can address those imbalances? Yeah. And I feel like there is a whole like bacterial imbalances playing out. And on one level, we don't need to know the specifics of the bacteria on one level, because we want to bring things into balance. Yeah, it's really good to know. It's really good that we now understand the microbiome and the mouth because it's so key. For example, everybody has strep in their mouth and that's a cavity causing bacteria. Everybody has it. Some people get cavities from it, some people don't. So what researchers are now starting to understand is that perhaps then that person or that mouth is missing the ancestral bacterial buddies, so to speak, that would keep the strep in balance. So that's why we don't want to have a scorched earth policy with the interior of our mouths, because we need, you know, we need a mouth of actually, we need a mouth of bustling bacteria to kind of keep the dentist away, which seems kind of crazy. But I also say with skincare, because we have a skin microbiome, the, the bacteria are the beautician, and we can't like benzoyl peroxide and exfoliate our microbiome away and expect good conditioned skin, right? So it's the same with our mouths. And um, what I also found so, find so fascinating is uh, many of the herbs and botanicals that have been used for thousands of years for oral care, like clove and cinnamon and rose and tea tree and frankincense, and you know, just depending what culture, what region of the earth, and um, those are things that I love using in oral care ingredients. But now with the study of the microbiome, we've got researchers that show that these ingredients, like the essential oil of clove, which is so classic for oral care, they contain quantum sensing, um, quantum sensing inhibitors, QSI for short. And what that means, oh, sorry, quorum sensing inhibitors. Um, so, pathogens like oral pathogens or pathogens in the body are sort of free floating around like phytoplankton sort of in the ocean of our bodies. And then um, when, you know, immune systems down or whatever, you know, they, when they start to, when there's imbalance, then these pathogens gain traction through the quorum sensing. So the quorum sensing helps them to find their buddies and group and form biofilms and you know, help their, the pathogens gene expression. So a quorum sensing inhibitor is something that inhibits all of that. So your clove, your cinnamon, your tea tree, they're inhibiting the quorum sensing, the grouping and the gene expression of the pathogens, which is awesome. And what's, and to me then, then things like an essential oil become the perfect medicine for balance because they're able to clean up the pathogens yet work with the beneficial bacteria without depleting it like an antibiotic would. And so they're able to clean up the pathogens but keep the beneficial bacteria intact, which really what else do you want, right? And then the other great thing about a lot of these beautiful botanicals is that they also help to like stimulate the gums, you know, they're vulnerary so they can help um, you know, the, the tissue in the mouth is uh, once it's epithelium, which is a very like one cell thin, so to speak, tissue. So as you know, it could maybe bleed pretty quick, like it, you know, it doesn't take much to have a bleeding gum, but it also can be quick to heal because it isn't thick skin. And so we can turn around things in the mouth if we have the right stuff. Yeah, that's an important point, how rapidly the mouth is capable of healing and changing, even more so than other parts of the body. Yeah. And that you mentioned that we all have strep in our mouth, just like a medulla. We all have strep in our gut. We have group B strep in our gut. Every pregnant mom has it. It's just the amount can affect whether or not it's going to become problematic during birth or not. Same thing in the mouth. It's not that we can ever fully eradicate these things. It's keeping them in balance. And I think understanding mm -hmm. that shifts us from a mindset of kill the bacteria, like you said, scorched earth, to know how can we nurture the right balance, which that was my focus in creating my company wellness with the toothpaste was how do we put these natural ingredients that help keep the, the good bacteria that we want and that help that bacteria to stay in the right balance and get stronger and help also it keep the other bad bacteria in balance because we're not the ones who are killing the bacteria. Our oral microbiome knows how to do that. If exactly. we get out of way. Yeah. And you also mentioned about blood sugar and how I love that point that 
you know, blood sugar might be more important than the sugar on your teeth, which I think mm -hmm. is another paradigm shift for a lot of people to understand. But let's talk about some of the ways that diet and lifestyle affect our teeth, because this was a new concept to me when I started reading, for instance, Weston A. Price and looking at traditional cultures and how beautiful and strong their teeth were and how he made that connection to diet and lifestyle. And I feel like we've lost a lot of that wisdom in our yeah. culture. Yeah, and I, we love the work of, of Dr. Weston Price. He, he was the president of the American Dental Association in the 30s, as you know, and then he traveled around the world with his wife, kind of like Indiana Jones style, because they were trying to find cultures that weren't, you know, totally uh, infiltrated by the white man, so to speak. And so he would he'd go to like the Hebrides, which are these Scottish islands, and then like a twin, twin brothers. There was like one in the coast, sort of like, so he was you know, at the port with all the like sugars and the, you know, pastry shops. And then the other brother was living inland. And then the difference in their, uh, you know, teeth structure was amazing. Or he'd go to like Swiss Alp regions. And then, you know, the tourist town, um, like that popular, is it St. Moritz? The, for skiing, you know, the teeth there versus the teeth of the little village that still had a, a church. And actually, I don't know why, but their, their church kept a lot of the skulls from the people that had been there before. So you're looking at all these really great dental, you know, teeth structures, and they're eating, you know, the butter that was made from the cows that were eating from the the low levels of the mountains in the spring, and then getting that, which he didn't know then was this vitamin K2 in the fat. Um, so yeah, what he really found was that we need our fats and that there's this something in the fat that really helps to activate things. And what modern science has deduced from his work is that is vitamin K2, which joins with vitamin D3 to um, what the great things about those two fat soluble vitamins is that they drive minerals into the bones, hence the teeth. So that's very important. Um, and right now we're really, you know, growing, eating food that has grown in the shadows of factory farming and pesticides, which do not allow proper photosynthesis. And then we're eating, you know, dairy, eggs, you know, butter, milk, meat from animals that have not seen sunshine and are not eating the grass made from the sunshine. So it's very, and then that's, and that all produces good amounts of K2 in the eggs and the dairy and all that, whereas factory farm animals, their eggs, like for example, have no K2. So we need that K2. And then we are of course living in a sunlight deprived society and that's our vitamin D generator. So, you know, we're lacking generally, we have, you know, the general population is deficient in D3 and K2. And those are so, so important to bone health. So that's, one thing I, I really appreciated about his work was just really seeing that we need those nutrients. And then it was the work of um, Dr. Melvin Page, who, so we, yeah, when we combine the Weston Price stuff with Dr. Melvin Page, and then there was also um, in holistic dental care, I talk about these other, this husband and wife research team, I think it was the Malembis. They were also at this time studying how school children you know, if they ate, I think they all ate oatmeal and they put like vitamin D in, you know, the, the vitamin D was basically reversing or stagnating cavity development. And then the oatmeal with no vitamin D, it was just uh, sending them down the path of more cavities. Um, so then when we combine this and also with the work of Dr. Melvin Page, because he was saying once your blood sugars uh, high, then you're not um, creating the same amount of phosphorus. So then your phosphorus ratio um, is depleted. And of course that also affects bone health. So it's just like bringing in all these interconnecting studies that are similar, but show us different things. So building on that, what are some of the ways we can get stronger? And of course that means also naturally whiter teeth. I know people yeah. also tend to use pretty harsh products to whiten yes. their teeth, including yes. ones that can harm the oral microbiome. But I know I've experimented with this and there's some natural ways to do it. So walk us through how we can build strong, beautiful teeth naturally. Yeah. Well, and then one thing to talk about with whiteness is the whiteness of the tooth is really coming from within. So we're very obsessed with the enamel, but enamel is actually like transparent, like glass. And it's the health of that pulp chamber, which I like to think of like fat and plumpy and juicy, right? Fat with fat soluble vitamins and all the nutrients. So your vitamin D3, K2 will, because it's creating health for the, dent, the pulp chamber, 
then that gets reflected through the teeth. So there's that really nutrient, the part of nutrients that will make white teeth. And then, then of course, yes, the enamel can be stained, but is it, or like it can get obviously discolored, but is it also because there's a buildup of plaque and tartar that is getting discolored, especially, you know, as we eat our blueberry smoothies and our whatever, right? So we eat a lot of high pigmented food or the, you know, wine, when you get that, the wine teeth at the end of the night, it's because it's also your plaque is getting discolored. So when we just think of it as an enamel, and then we're using these chemicals on the enamel, you know, then we're not really, then we're making the enamel thin and prone to yellowing as we age, because, you know, we we're, we're taking away from the tenacity of the, the integrity of the enamel. So there's that now to keep it white. So we think of our nutrition and fat soluble vitamins. And then, um, you know, hydrogen peroxide is a great thing. You don't want to use it too much because it can be a bit astringent on the gums and we want to really keep the gums healthy. And uh, like, I like to think of them like turtlenecks around the teeth, like nice, cozy, gums you don't want receding gums taking you to like a v-neck or like a cowl neck situation so we've got to care for those gums um but you know doing like a diluted you know generally you want to use hydrogen peroxide at three percent but even you can even take it down to like a one percent for a more regular rinse and then if you follow any hydrogen peroxide rinse with a baking soda infused water rinse which is just like throwing some baking soda in water you don't have to necessarily measure it that because that's immediate alkalizing so then that you know alkalinity will just calm the mouth down and then another fun thing you can do is just take some baking soda kind of like just put baking soda in a little empty jar and then put a little of your diluted three percent hydrogen peroxide in there mix it up don't put a lid on and you kind of let it dry out kind of evaporate and then you have this kind of infused hydrogen peroxide baking soda and then that's just really good for like whitening your teeth like once or twice a month as well. Those are awesome tips. And this will be a probably a little bit more controversial of a question, but one that I also came to my own research and the question of if cavities are reversible because conventional dentistry seems to say under no circumstances can they get better. The only solution is to fill them. And this was another area that when I started researching, I was really surprised that there seemed to be a lot more to the story than that. Yes. I. I too was completely surprised. And yeah, that is conventional dentistry. But when you go into, because anything I know, I know from dentists, like obviously, right? They're the ones with that firsthand experience. And there's some really renegade dentists that have really gone into it. And so, yes, you can, you can st uh, stop a cavity in its tracks with, again, just literally bringing up the nutrients, um, getting your vitamin D up. Uh, you can also, yeah, which is really, you can just stop it and generally it will repair. It does, so that tooth may be discolored a bit at the end, but the cavity has ceased. You can't regrow a tooth at this time, but the technology's there. And like 10 years ago, uh, it was supposed to be coming in about five years. So I'm not too sure where it's at yet, but we, it should be happening any day, but they can fully, they make like, they have a little like silicone kind of mold, you know, like that's the shape of your tooth, put that on the gum line. I believe they've done it with pigs and then through stem cells and different things, they just kind of put that on and the tooth does eventually regrow. So I feel like that's definitely in all of our future, but yeah, you can definitely cease a, a cavity. You can stop it in its tract and the tooth will rejuvenate that tooth area, but the tooth isn't necessarily going to regrow. So if you've had a tooth filled, that's, you know, you're stuck with that. And um, it's good if you can have a dentist where, that's actually how I found out about it back when I, before I created the healthy gumdrops, I was at a holistic dentist. They weren't that holistic, but the hygienist was very good. And she was like, you know, I had neglected, that's also, I had to really think about gum care and stuff, but she's like, you have a beginning of a cavity. Um, so she's like, go home, mix your oils up or whatever you do, take care of it and come back in six months and we'll x-ray it again. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> this is a thing. And so I did. And that's how I made that creation. But it was so neat to get firsthand to see like, it's not, you know, like when you're a kid and it's like, you have a cavity and we're going to fill it. 
So yeah, and that's what I go into into my book is how you can stop or reverse a cavity, depending at what stage it's at, depending how you're gonna, but yeah, we've had many kids go to the dentist, they've had seven, they do the protocol, they go back and maybe only one needs to be filled or something like that. So we wanna know that our teeth is alive, our mouth is alive and it is connected to the rest of the body. And so we can heal, we can regenerate, you know, the gum pockets, if, the, if you've got receding gum pockets, you can, you can bring those back down, you can really help the situation. Um, and one thing I wanted to add, so anything that you can do for bone health is going to help the teeth as well. Um, you know, diagnosis of cavities as well as disease is up in the springtime. So then that's because if you, you know, a lot of us have no sunlight in the winter. So we're kind of right. We're, so it's like, there's a cavity season and it's definitely related to the lack of sunshine. So that's also important for bone health. And then I also like a pulsed electromagnetic frequency, a PEMF, you know, that just helps bones in general. And that does help strengthen teeth as well. Yeah, I remember very clearly reading in an elementary school textbook that teeth were the only part of the body that could not heal at all. And now I look back and think, well, that's silly because I had a similar experience where I had many small cavities starting. None of them yeah. were paying them, no more through to the dentin. And I did this, it's probably a similar protocol. I'll make sure your book, of course, is linked in the show notes. You guys can have the details of that protocol and went to a new dentist because we moved and they found no cavities. And that was such a light bulb moment for me. Um, and yeah. I definitely, I want to go into the, the sunshine aspect as well, but I also love that you brought up pulse electromagnetic therapy. I know this isn't one necessarily that everybody's going to have access to, but um, I saw this firsthand. My daughter broke her arm in two places while pole vaulting. And oh, so wow. EMF was one of the things we did while she was recovering. And yeah. we went back, it was a really severe break. And three weeks later, it was completely healed and set. And I think PEMF and K27 and a lot of these things we're talking about were a big part of the reason she healed so rapidly. Um, you mis mentioned mixing up oils. And another thing I've written quite a bit about is oil pulling. And nice. you, I'd love to hear your take on it. And can you mm -hmm. explain it for someone who might not be familiar and talk about maybe best oils to use, how to do it, any specifics we need to know? Yeah. Well, oil pulling is, it seems to have its roots in Ayurvedic medicine which is, and it's really just about, uh, traditionally they would use a coconut oil or sesame seed oil, which you can use. You can also use, I think, jojoba, uh, olive oil or MCT oil being a derivative of the coconut oil. And I like those because they don't, um, you know, coconut oil could solidify in the, when you spit it out in your drain because it's solid at room temperature. So MCT is really nice for that. And then I'll, it's just simply taking a teaspoon and swishing it in your mouth for like 10, 15 minutes and spitting it out. So that's the simple mechanics of it. And of course you can kind of upgrade that by adding you know, a drop of peppermint to that teaspoon or a little bit of charcoal or some probiotics, some prebiotics. And I have recipes, um, I think in both books and maybe even our website on um, making tooth butter cups, which you can just basically you know, take your oil, uh, like a coconut oil, I don't have the exact recipe in my head. And then add essential oils, um, add your probiotics, and then put that into like a little silicone tray and uh, like a tiny cubes, pop that in the fridge for a couple of hours. And then you can pop those into a jar, have them on the jar, a jar in your, you know, on your uh, bathroom counter. And then kids and adults can just pop a cube in their mouth and then do their oil swishing that way. Yeah, we kept, we keep a separate little mini trash can just for spitting coconut oil so it doesn't plug the drain. So that's my little tip is to your point, Perfect. don't spit it in the drain. Yeah. Um, a couple more quick questions related to oral health. And then I want to make sure we also get to talk about sunlight because I think this is a very important related topic. Um, the first being, are there any other steps people can take to avoid cavities and gum disease? I know you talk a lot about this in your book, so I would definitely encourage you guys to grab the book, but especially maybe for parents listening or just for any of us, what are some things we can you know, avoid or do that help in either direction? You know, there's the oil pulling, which is great. I think there's also just, especially for kids, just swishing. So just taking like baking soda, popping it in water, or even making a salt water by taking like a teaspoon of salt to water and making these sort of alkalizing swishing solutions, which are great if you've eaten acidic stuff or fruit, you know, like a grapefruit or had some kombucha, then you can neutralize the mouth. And obviously kids don't have their brushing skills 
figured out fully. So the swishing just helps take care of the whole mouth. It alkalinizes it. Um, another great thing is like liquid magnesium. You can dilute that in water. And again, that's really alkalinizing for the mouth. Um, then of course diet. And then how we're brushing is so important as well because it's very easy to, you know, like help the bleeding and receding gums if we're not brushing properly. So your toothbrush, you know, six months from now shouldn't have any splayed, like a toothbrush shouldn't have splayed bristles, that kind of thing. And you want to brush, you know, you want to think about the gums too, just how we kind of dry brush the body. You also want to kind of brush and stimulate those gums and you start brushing sort of up, you know, up on the gum practically like where your cheek starts and the gum and you're brushing we usually go up and down. You actually wanna do one direction brushing because we got the sulca, which is where the gum line joins the teeth. We really wanna take care of that area. We don't wanna send stuff up underneath it. So you're brushing on the top teeth, you know, down, bottom teeth up, not back and forth. So that's really key as well. And then, you know, cleaning your toothbrush in a hydrogen peroxide, just having it sit in a 3% hydrogen peroxide a couple of times a week is also really good to keep your brush super clean. Make sure your brush is always like fully drying. So hopefully you got like maybe a you know, sunny place in your bathroom. Um, if your bathroom, you know, is kind of damp and, you know, there could be un unseen mold in that situation, you definitely don't want your toothbrushes hanging out in that kind of a bathroom. So that's important too, just like, you know, how we're brushing, that kind of thing. And what about root canals? I know this, this is another controversial topic and I always get the questions like, what if you haven't had one, why should you avoid them? And then if you have had one, what do you do? Yeah, so we do wanna avoid root canals. The, the concept's cool. Like it seemed like it was a good idea where you can preserve the tooth. That pulp chamber we talk about is basically cleaned and scraped out of the tooth. Um, but, and the idea is that it's sterile and hermetically sealed, but no root cal canal is, and it can't be sterile because our molars have 300 meters of microscopic tubules in one tooth. So we can't sterilize it, it's impossible. Um, so a root canal, even if it's not bothering you and it seems like it, everything's fine, is really a harboring and creating necrotic bacteria uh, that then seeps into the bloodstream. And uh, so you do want to avoid a root canal. And also sometimes you actually don't, it's not even a root canal candidate. So that I talk about that in my book too, like where um, a couple of journalists have had you know, really decide, okay, they've gone to the dentist set like somewhere and, and decided really what needed to happen to that mouth. And then, you know, they would see 20 or 50 different dentists and have literally like 50 different pro, like, you know, from $500 appointment to like $30,000 appointment. So even though they're all looking at the same x-rays, these dentists, you can see the amount of interpretation that is really and then when actually the ADA was asked about this one journalist 50 you know uh, story uh, the ADA was like well you know dentistry is an art not a science so that was a surprising uh, message so a like do you is it really really a root canal candidate or you know does it need a filling or what is going on and then you want I mean the, the most important thing is to also find a dentist that really works with biocompatible materials is truly holistic because a lot of us actually need to undo previous dental work. And then, you know, you want a good future because now we know that like one move at a dentist, like getting a root canal could affect us 30 years down the road. Um, even with extractions like a wisdom tooth or having things extracted, now we know too that those extractions, they leave the standard protocol to leave the periodontal ligament in. So what we didn't know, but now we do know is that, that the gum grows over that periodontal ligament and then that periodontal ligament kind of rots the jaw bone. And then there's jaw cavitations that don't show up on a regular X-ray until they're 80% developed. So I bring that all up also, because if you have a root canal, the same, you know, that you're gonna need that. So you don't, if you have a root canal, you don't necessarily need to have it removed. You want to keep an eye on it. And if you have 
you know, anything declining in your health or an autoimmune thing, you can't figure it out. That's, you know, you're going to want to most likely have that root canal tooth removed. There's a doctor in Europe who's been working with cancer patients for decades, Dr. Joseph Isels, and he is like, you've got to remove root canal teeth before, you know, he'll work with you. But causation is not necessary co correlation. So we got to keep that in mind. We don't need to be taking out all of our root canals, but you really got to think about your situation. And of course, if it's a back molar, it's pretty easy to just have it removed and you don't need anything in its place. If it's front teeth, you know, we're gonna, you're gonna wanna have uh, something in place. So there's bridges, which is, uh, you know, it's a bit of a compromise because you have to shave down good teeth on each side so it could stay in. There are things like temps, which you can just pop in for going out, but I really still feel like you want something for your structure. Um, and then traditionally, you know, a tooth could be put in with a post, but those are titanium posts, which is a very toxic metal. Um, so biological dentists that know their stuff will use either a zirconium or a, a ceramic. And so that's important to know that those choices are out there and they have, you know, zirconium has been used for about 30 years in Europe, has a very good track record for our immune systems. Um, it's still a foreign object in the body, but it has a way better track record. So that might be something you'll consider for the front. Um, but if it is a, a root canal, or if you do need something extracted, um, but just know that 67% of all wisdom teeth removals are not needed. Um, so anyway, you do need that taken out. So if there is something being removed, you got to go to a dentist that will also remove the periodontal ligament. Or if you've had wisdom teeth removed before or an extraction, uh, a good dentist can check those and see if there is a jaw cavitation. I had mine done definitely where, you know, I had two wisdom teeth removed when I was in my twenties, there was cavitations there. And what they have to do is scrape the bone, scrape off the infection, allow blood flow back to the area, a blood clot forms, which is good and healing to that area. And it cl cleans it out. So that's a good thing is we can take care of the jaw cavitations and there are solutions for root canals, but the studies that were done show that 100% of all root canals do harbor necrotic bacteria, and uh, that can really be pulling our immune systems down. Wow, that was awesome. I took a lot of notes for the show notes, and I can <laughs> find all of those at wellnessmama.fm. And I wanted to make sure we reserved a little bit of time to talk about the importance of the sun, because this is another area that I feel like we made some missteps when it comes to our modern interpretation and that we are now seeing the real-time results of our fear of the sun. So let's start broad and talk about why the sun is so important and then maybe go into some of the reasons we might not want to avoid it as much as we have been. Yeah, well, I really like, if we think about it, I mean, the sun is really the capstone of our existence. It's like why everything's alive on the planet and we don't really want to cut off that life force, you know, in general. Of course, I think the, the fear, the, a lot of the fear of the sun has come from our skin. But when we really step back and look at the design of the skin, we will know that there are thousands of vitamin D receptors that are ready to respond to the skin. They want to be filled with all the information from sunbeams, you know, being received by those vitamin D receptors. We want to have those vitamin D receptors brimming with vitamin D as this is so key to our immune system. When the vitamin D receptors are filled with vitamin D, then things like bacterial lingens can't come and uh, basically switch off the immune system because they can't get into those vitamin D receptor sites. So our skin is literally designed to be exposed to the sun's rays. And um, you know our skin dilates to receive those rays and besides vitamin D, which comes from the ultraviolet rays, there's the whole spectrum of visible and invisible light, which I'm sure for you know, hundreds of years to come, we will continue to find out you know, more and more about how beneficial they are. But there's you know, the infrared light spectrum as well, which is very important to cellular health, literally communicating with our mitochondria so when we are exposed to sunlight during the daytime, we get, you know, if it's a time uh, in winter here, we don't have the UV, UV rays to create a sun uh, 
suntan, but we have the other, you know, the infrared and stuff that we can get from it. But why we want the full range of light is because it's literally giving our bodies information and nourishment that isn't something we can get from a bottle. And taking, having vitamin D, we're so lucky that it is a supplement and we can have it, but that's a fat soluble form of vitamin D. And when our, our skin and the sun make a water soluble form of vitamin D, which is very essential to our inner nourishment, it's, it, vitamin D is really, it's called a vitamin, but it's really this hormone that we need. We also create a very healthy cholesterol sulfate. Vitamin D levels being sufficient helps to balance cholesterol levels. So if the cholesterol levels are out of whack, it could be because you're not sufficient in vitamin D, for example. Um, so we've got like that whole situation going on where being time the sun also helps to create things like antimicrobial peptides and catholicidins, which then help to prevent cytokine storms in the body, which is great. And um, then we work, you know, building up our melanin layers also helps to create kind of our own sunblock so that if we start slowly but surely and we start in the spring, we can build up a layer so that we have sun protection in July, for example. So that's really key. Also daytime exposure to sunlight creates a melatonin that is just in the cellular level. So at night we create a melatonin from the pineal gland that circulates through our body, which is awesome and essential for sleep. But the daytime, this, this uh, production inside the cell doesn't circulate through the blood, so we won't get sleepy, but it, it it's like, it's an antioxidant that's more powerful than glutathione. And what it does, it acts like a cooling fluid for the production because the mitochondria help to convert uh, and make uh, energy for the ATP. And in that conversion and making that energy, there's um, reacts, uh, our reactive oxygen species are created. And so even in the healthiest person, so we need that cellular production of daytime melatonin to be like the cooling fluid that cools down that process of making the energy in our cells. So there's just so many secrets to that can get revealed when your body starts talking, you know, to the sun, getting that information it needs. And um, I think getting that base layer of melon in the body is is good for the, is good for our skin. And it's the it's the reasonable and wise interaction with the sun that is good for the skin, good for the body, and not going to create wrinkles. We get wrinkles when we are fueled on poly, you know, like PUFA oils of mazola, canola, and then we're baking in those bodies, drinking Coca-Cola, and then using sunscreen, which we know is filled with endocrine disruptors. But the real issue with sunscreen, or like the further issue, is that then we receive, the, we are cut off from the UVB rays. So through sunscreen, we say no to the UVB, which is the vitamin D producing ray. And then we just get its ultraviolet partner UVA without UVB and UVA on its own is skin damaging. So that's the silly part of it all is that we're, if you're tanning with sunscreen, you're not getting vitamin D and you're creating uh, skin damage. And I would love to do a round two with you one day because I know you also have a lot of expertise related to the skin and there's so much we didn't have time to cover today, but to make sure we respect our time in this episode, a couple last questions I love to ask. The first being, if there's a book or number of books that have profoundly impacted your life, and if so, what they are and why. I really, you know, I'll, I'll love, I love any Rumi, like Rumi, I feel like I, has really impacted me. Um, saying things through like a poetic line. Sometimes there's like a whole world in a sentence that I really love with that. And then um, you know, Krishnamurti, uh, this uh, philosopher, I guess, uh, he, was, he died in 1986, but he has a whole realm of books that are just so great. Um, books like um, This Light in Oneself, The Revolution Within, uh, those have been, were very profound, I think, in my understanding of you know, how the mind works and just existing on this planet. So I'm really thankful to those two people. I'll put links in the show notes to those as well. So you guys can find those and any parting advice for the listeners today that could be related to something we've talked about or entirely unrelated. 
get outside and in the sun. <laughs> I second that completely. That is what I'm going to be doing as soon as we wrap up this podcast. Me too. <laughs> such a wealth of knowledge. This was a really, really fun interview. I think we got to go deep on some really fun topics. Like I said, I'd love to do another round one day and get to tackle some more, but thank you so much for so generously sharing your time today. Thank you so much. It was truly my pleasure. And thanks as always to all of you for listening and sharing your most valuable resources, your time, your energy, and your attention with us today. We're both so grateful that you did. And I hope that you will join me again on the next episode of the Wellness Mama podcast.